Well, I also think there are a lot of a lot of young people that gravitate to this technology naturally. I mean, if it, not just out of sheer a customization because they've grown up with it, but they they like it. They like the interface, and they seem to be quite nimble with it. You know, for I think this would be a popular option for a lot of kids. Well, I think popular, yes. Uh, whether or not it's uh, effective or best suited, yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say appropriate simply because you know there's this idea that the kids, because they've grown up in with all of these digital technologies around them, that somehow that they learn differently and and they're much more skilled with these things. And in all honesty, there's no research to support that at all. So whenever you hear these labels like millennials or digital generation or or digital natives, um, these are basically people blowing, blowing smoke up your bum. Um, you know, this is the only thing that we know about this particular generation of students based upon the actual research is the fact that they are actually more narcissistic than any generation before. And that comes from the work by Jean Twinge out of California, um, popularized by her book Generation Me. And yet some kids will gravitate to it. I mean, just in the same way uh, that independent learning or non-structured environments have been offered for several years. At least they were in Alberta, where I'm from, Michael. Oh, yeah. I mean, kids, like I say, it'll be popular among the kids. But whether or not it's, it's a, it, that shouldn't be mistaken with whether or not that's appropriate because somehow this, digi, this generation of learners are digital learners. Um, you know, by all means, there are some students that won't be motivated in a traditional classroom no matter how much the teacher does. And it's nothing against the teacher. It's just, you know, there's something that's not clicking between that student and that teacher. In those kind of situations, you have to look for alternate opportunities. And, and you know, this day and age, technology has to be one of those things that you look at. Um, it's just a, a mistake to believe that this generation is just suited to being good technical learners. Um, most of the research out there suggests that you know, their technical knowledge is, is uh, a mile wide and an inch deep. And let's face it, when you're learning online, you need to have a, a depth of understanding of how to use the technology. And that's actually one of the biggest barriers right now. You know, you can't just put a student in front of the computer and expect them to learn well. You've actually got to give them a lot of skills, uh, both te technical skills that they need to learn online, but things like self-directedness, self-motivation. Um, you know, it does require a fair amount of support at the school level, and that's actually, I think, one of the beautiful things about the funding model that they've got in BC. They've recognized that. They don't just provide funding based upon who's delivering the course. They still have that one-seventh set aside. Um, so that, you know, it provides that money back to the school because they recognize that the school still has that supporting role to play. So let's talk about the report and, 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 and putting it out each year. What do you hope to accomplish? What's the overriding goal here? Um, well, one of the things is just to, to let Canadians, and particularly Canadian policymakers, find out a little bit more about what other jurisdictions are doing. Um, one of the things that, that we don't do a good job in Canada, not just on this front, but I think a lot of fronts, we do a lot of wonderful, amazing things in Canada that not only does the rest of the world not know about, but we don't even know about. We don't blow our own horns. Um, you know, and when you compare that to what you see south of the 49th, um, you know, they get up in the, in the morning and put their pants on correctly, and it seems like it's a national announcement. Um, so what you tend to find is when you look at the literature that's out there, and you, you go to, say, Google or Yahoo or, and look at what the news stories are, you can't go a single day without seeing all the wonderful things the Americans are doing with digital education and digital learning. But yet you don't see anything about Canada in, in that respect. And, and typically when it, you do, it tends to be some kind of negative story. So just actually getting an annual update that says, you know, this is how we are doing. And, and we are doing some pretty interesting and wonderful things here in this country. And, you know, there are some provinces that are doing a, a little bit more than others. And, and people are going at it different ways. And, and because a lot of the governments right now, have strategies related to distance education that in some cases are a decade or more old, they're in the process now of updating what it is they're doing. Alberta just went through this process actually over the past three years, uh, initially developing a new distributed learning strategy and then rolling that into this inspiring action on education initiative that they're moving towards now. But that was sort of the first really hard look that they've taken at distance education in terms of policy and structure and how they should go about supporting it in 
quite some time. You know, so these kind of, these kind of annual documents actually give them a guideline to say, you know, look, this is what they're doing over in Nova Scotia or down, you know, in, in over in British Columbia or down in Newfoundland. You know, let's see what they're doing and how might that look if we were to try to adapt it for our context. And and would that be in that adaptation, would it be for particular circumstances and not the, 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 the general school population en masse, correct? Um, no, I think it would be the general population en masse. So, like, if you look at that funding model for British Columbia, it's the only province that has that kind of funding follows the student to whoever is delivering the course. Is that something that Quebec should adopt or Manitoba, who are also going through a review of their distributed learning policies right now? Um, you know, so this is something that they can look at and say, you know, is this useful for us? You know, in the case of Ontario, for example, they actually have a, a policy where uh, school districts cooperate amongst themselves. So if, if you've got two schools in a, in a school district that's running a distance ed program, it doesn't matter because the district is still getting all of the funding. So and they figure that, you know, if one school has one extra student this year enrolled in distance ed and compared to school B, it's not going to make a difference. But if you have one school district getting distance ed from a different school district, they're actually supposed to charge that second school district a fee of $680 or so. Wow. Um, you know, so the funding doesn't follow the student, but the district that gets all of the funding has to pay a fee to let their student enroll in a program offered by another district. Um, you know, is that a better model than what you've got in BC? You know, I, I'm not, I can't answer that because, you know, there's a lot of variables, and in all honesty, it would depend on jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, I can tell you that the program seems to be working fairly well here in Ontario, and in, and they've actually, the districts have found cooperative ways of actually dealing with that um, that I think are quite creative. They've, they've actually formed three or four different cooperatives so that the districts actually work together and do this trading of students. Uh, so that way the funding actually ends up being a wash in, at the end of the day. And this has all been catalyzed by online learning? Yes. See, now there, there in itself, that shows the inherent value of pursuing this. But it is providing new opportunities. It's, oh, it's making people so. think differently. Yes, um, you know, because let's face it, I mean, it's this idea that you mentioned earlier, you know, that if, does the student physically need to sit in a seat in a classroom in order to learn or are there other ways in which we can look at providing educational opportunity that don't necessarily involve having everyone there together at the same time in the same place? And I think for most kids, being there is crucial, but n not for everyone all the time. No, and for that matter, they could all be there, but do they all have to be in the same place? You know, there was an article that came out in one of the Nova Scotia newspapers just yesterday uh, where uh, Katie University professor Michael Corbett uh, was quoted as saying, you know, can you imagine what rural schools would look like if we, instead of thinking of them as schools, thought of them as video conferencing nodes where the teachers would come to the building, the students would come to the building, but when they did their courses, you know, the teacher, to use uh, some British Columbia examples, you know, the teacher sitting in Vancouver might be teaching students over this video conferencing system that were sitting in Victoria, that were sitting in Trail, that were sitting up in uh, uh, Vernon, you know, that were sitting over in Burnaby. You know, so they're all still sitting there at the same time, but they're not all physically in the same location but they are still, you know, in a class together. And that's what technology shows us. It shows yeah, us there it, is capacity. Yeah, it provides all these potential opportunities that we can look at and say, you know, is this appropriate for this particular student? Absolutely. Michael, we're right out of time. Thanks so much for joining us today. A fascinating discussion. Not a problem. Uh, it was a pleasure. Take care. Yep, you too. Bye. Bye-bye. Michael Barber joining us on the line. He's an assistant professor at Wayne State University in Detroit, and this is the fourth annual report uh, about uh, distance learning here in Canada.